everyone. We are about to resume. Let's give a hand again for Peter M. from Florida. Woo! I'm Peter, recovered alcoholic. And uh, anyway, I uh, I hope the first talk wasn't. Um, I don't prepare for these things. You know, I have a speech. Um, I almost never read anything uh, having to do with spirituality when I know I'm going to go give a talk or listen to anything because that just gets in the way. Um, my preparation is my prayer this morning. My communing with God during the day. I fast four hours before I do these things. I take almost no phone calls unless it's important. And what I did last night, what I did yesterday, the day before, and so on. That's my preparation to see what God has to be a hollow bone when I get here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so I hope it didn't put someone off. And so, oh my God, you know, um, I don't do those things, so I'm not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, a literature tells us you remember when you say you are, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm an alcoholic. It's a threefold illness that we suffer from in body, mind, and spirit. So I guess the question is, how free do we want to be? You know, if I'm not experiencing freedom here, what am I doing to seek freedom? Because what the 12 steps does is speak loudly for that power that cannot be spoken about. How free am I? If I go to an ocean with a thimble, I'm going to come home with a thimble full of water. And so I get a little bit of AA, get some steps, get a little God in my life. And uh, <clears throat> I stop after the first course. I'm good. And let them do it. Let the newcomers do it. Make sure my sponsees are doing all the work. But I can kick back and begin to miss some meetings. Then that little bit of freedom that I've experienced starts to wane. And I'm not going to submit to going through the work again. I'm not going to submit to a sponsor I have to be accountable to and have transparency with. So I get a little information, read a little here, go to a couple of workshops and things like that and whet my appetite and that's it. Now, <clears throat> I say that because when I drank, I was a glutton. There was no such thing as having a little drink, a shot. And so that's good, burns, nice, see you tomorrow. Because once I have the first drink, I'm having the second drink and more is better. And I come into Alcoholics Anonymous and I get a taste. For little dolphins, one bump and you're going home? You're going to put your nose in the, the bag and, you know, come up like, like Al Pacino and Scarface where it's all over you. <clears throat> I identify with that. You know? I think everything's cool. We come into Alcoholics Anonymous and we get a little taste. You get nice and you go, I'm going home. That's it. There's too much God in this meeting. I've had enough God. I'm driving tonight. Too much God. <laughs> Do you ever notice how, um, well, I'll speak for myself. Not so much with liquor, because you go to a liquor store, I get my pint, or go, if I was at a bar, I'd have a big ballroom career. Uh, I was too self-conscious, and I knew I was going to get drunk and get it thrown out, and the bouncers would rough me up. I like liquor stores, going into the hallway with my pint and getting drunk and passing out. But during my drug years, I did zero due diligence on Flacco, the drug dealer. I didn't do a background check and a criminal history on Flacco, the drug dealer. I didn't, you know, find out where the stuff was made, when it was picked, the temperature, and who picked it, and how long it took to get shipped here and what it was cut with. I just said, give me two, went home, and off I went. With me? Coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, well, let's talk more about this God. I need to find out a full financial report on God. I need a background check on God. I need to qualify my sponsor, make sure he or she is the quality type. And I do all this stuff and all it does is delay the inevitable me getting drunk. Rather than looking at it like this fountain of water and I'm dying of thirst. And I'm just diving in head first. Because that's how I drunk, drank, head first, right in. How free do I want to be? I'm going to read something. It's from a gentleman. Uh, 
Well, I can't endorse an outside enterprise, so spiritual man, we'll call it that. What I tend to think is I can win God over. If I get enough information, I'll win God over. If I get enough information, I'll do good deeds to win God over. Hmm? Forgetting, I was a certain way coming in here. I had a certain rhythm to my life, a certain outlook, a certain belief system, a certain behavior, a certain way of dressing. And I come into Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm sober. And I'm a youngin, counting days and months, maybe a year. And the reality is nothing has really changed other than I'm dry. Got a little healthier, obviously I'm not drinking or doing other things, but nothing has really changed spiritually for me. I'm in a lot of self-reliance and relying on a lot of old belief systems, attitudes and ideas, which drove me into a wall all the time. My relationships, the people I run with, look almost the same, except we're all not using. Now at the beginning, it's going to be like that, but none of us are taking strides to get locked into a sponsor. Paul, can you sponsor me, take me through the work? Ron, can you sponsor me, take me through the work? Joe, can you sponsor me, take me through the work? I'm dying. We just run with the pack. Six months, a year goes by, we're exactly the same. And what's worse is I get into the relationship with her, or if it's a her, with him, who has the same pack of garbage expecting to find marital bliss in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it looks a lot like, nothing spelled L-O-V better than stalking, right? That's what it looks like. It's the same thing. <laughs> While I'm sober. And so what I need is to get connected with a teacher, a sponsor, who's about to disarm me and rip the covers off the ball. Strip the tree down to nothing. A bad tree bears bad fruit. And no one can eat from the vine because they'll get sick. A good tree is going to bear good fruit and we can eat from the vine. You will know them by their fruits. Because that's what we do here. We go to the sponsor and they feed us spiritual information. We get soul food in here. We work out in AA called the spiritual gym, which is way beyond just gathering information. Now we're seeking and getting transformation. Personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. So here's the analogy. <clears throat> Let's pretend I want to get in shape. And so I join a gym and pay way too much money like most gyms cost. And I go to like, you know, one of these uh, uh, malls and I get nice gym clothes and get all the stuff and new runners and I get into the gym. What I do is I get there really early. Gym opens up at 6 a.m., I'm there at 5. And I do this every single day for 90 days. Get in there at 5, I meet the, the, the guy who runs the gym, I see people coming in, I'm shaking hands, I know all the members of the gym. In fact, after about 30 days, I know a lot about the machines, I'm helping the manager put out the towels, I stay till the place closes and everyone leaves. I'm still there and I'm helping them throw the stuff in, 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 in the wash and cleaning up for tomorrow morning. Everybody knows me, I know them, I know all about the equipment and after 90 days, because I haven't worked out. I'm in worse shape than when I started. And what's worse, Paul and I joined on the same day, pretend, but Paul is working out. He's bench pressing, he's running, he's doing all this stuff. After 90 days, Paul looks good. I hate him in the gym because none of it works. <laughs> oh, Mr. Mr. Big Shot, him in his gym, right? Him in his big book. And the gym I went there, it doesn't work. It's a waste of, they only want my money. And then someone says, did you at least open an envelope? Did you break a sweat? Did you do anything? Well, no, and I give you all the excuses why. No wonder why. See, the mind digs the hole, and the same mind looks to fill it. And then it fills it and digs another hole, over and over and over again. So I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and after 90 days, I still haven't gone through the 12 steps. And after 90 days, I still don't have a sponsor. After 90 days, I'm pretty much in the same jam I was while I was using. I'm just not using. 
And after 90 days, I'm running with the same people. I got the same look, the same kind of outlook on life, the same kind of threads that I came in here with. They might be a little newer, but it's the same, it's the same guy. And what I do is try to control, manipulate God and others, and win God over. And here come attachments, because I think that's who I am. And I think going to meetings is going to treat my alcoholism or my addiction, and it doesn't. It's one part of a three-sided triangle, yes? I heard it explained best by a gentleman I met. Alcoholism in us looks like this. We are all, imagine this, cars in a parking lot. Every one of us are a car in a parking lot. Right? Ron has the BMW, of course, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> we all have cars in a parking lot. We're all cars in a parking lot. Alcoholism has the keys to every one of us. Now, when I go to stop my car, my car doesn't say, Pete, I don't feel like going anywhere today. Can we hang out? I put the key in and it drives. It can't stop me from driving it. Alcoholism comes into the parking lot and says, you. Puts the key and it runs as long as it wants. And when it returns, it picks another one. And I'm powerless to stop the key from going in the ignition. That car gets taken. We get hijacked. And somehow I think, because I'm sitting in the parking lot, called Alcoholics Anonymous, that it won't come and pick on me. How many folks do we know, right before a year, right after the year, get loaded? They were sitting in a parking lot. They did nothing while they were there. So I have to ask myself after 90 days, where am I spiritually? Step three, step nine, whatever it is, where am I spiritually? Spiritually, how am I? Have my perceptions and conceptions on life changed? Shift in consciousness. Awaken to certain things. Moved out of a toxic relationship. Staying out of relationships because deep within, I know it's not going to work because I'm still the same guy. What's even better is I know all I'm looking to do is get some affirmation, some power, some control, instant gratification, that I'm not ready for a relationship. What I need to have is a relationship with God before I can have a relationship with a guppy. The ego doesn't want to hear any of this information, and I can quickly spot myself that I'm living in ego or I'm living in spirit. In fact, people will notice that way before we do. So we come to prayer meditation, in 10, 11, 12, when I'm supposed to be waking up spiritually, enhancing this beautiful experience, because when we get to step 10, we've awakened. It tells us that. It talks about getting recovered. It doesn't say those words, but it says the problem has been removed. We're awake. We've recovered from a singly hopeless state of mind and body. And then we begin to enhance and grow in understanding and effectiveness. Have more godly experience, more outlook uh, 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 a better outlook on life. We're seeing the world, if you will, through God's eyes. We're hearing the world through God's ears. The language we speak sounds godly, and the actions follow. We are not the same people, how we speak, how we dress, how we be. And we're working with prayer and meditation with me. And I can, because I did, get quickly attached to that and become an idol worshiper rather than worshiping God and practicing fidelity to God. It's not putting money before God, I have. It's not putting my career before God, and I have. It's not putting my wants and desires before God, and I have. It's actually, it looks like, if we look at it, putting, trying to get to God, the methodology before God. Looks like this. I get up in the morning, I, pr I, I pray, and then I meditate. I meditate for 45 minutes every morning. Do you go to work? <laughs> and I say that because if you're not getting up, if you're, if you're like most of us, got to be in the office by 8 or 9 o'clock, you're getting up really early, especially if you have kids in the house. And some of us do that. I stop tracking how long I meditate. My teachers told me 10 minutes is a good minimum. 
I don't know if it's 20 minutes. I don't know if it's 30 minutes. I don't know if it's eight and a half minutes or nine minutes and 45 seconds. I don't know. Because if I do know, unless I'm on a timer, I've gotten attached to how much time I'm in there. And while I'm watching that clock in 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, I forgot about God. I got into reading 24 hour day book, daily reflections, upper room, meditation from men, meditation from men. If you're from Brooklyn, it was blank meditation from <laughs> All these things, I have to read all these things, then read 10 and 11 in here. I had sage, I had candles, I had incense, I had CDs, I had gongs, and it was like an orchestra and a light show, and I'm supposed to be meditating, and the only thing that's meditating is that stuff. Because you got sage, candles, got this, got that, okay, red, good, okay. Wow, 45 minutes is up, I'm out. And I think I just won over God. See God, look at me. And I'm doing nothing for the soul. I'm doing everything. I'm stroking the ego. And I leave the house and I turn back. I forgot that one book. I got to read that page. Go back, read it. Because I can't leave the house without it. I'm an idol worshiper now. No flesh shall glory in his presence. Quick story. Moses goes to the mount. The burning bush. Famous words. Take your sandals off. You're standing on holy ground. Right? Out of respect, he's in the presence of God, you kick off your shoes. There's a little bit more to that story. He needed nothing. We wear shoes, we wear sandals, not only because they're nice looking, but the basic principles to protect the bottom of our feet from walking on the ground. Right? He stood in the presence of God like we do, and we need nothing. Take off your sandals. You don't need the army. You don't need a cell phone. You don't need a vape. You don't need this. You don't need that. You don't need anything. Drop everything. God is saying, I will care for you. How many times do we approach recovery? I need the job, need the money, need the girl, need the car, need this, got the phone, got the new phone, got a vape. I'm walking around with a vape this big. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> It looks like London in some meetings. It's, you know, it's like they're hitting a bong, but I'm sober. The ritual is free basing. If you, if you vape, it's a vape, I don't care. I look at the behavior. So you got all this stuff going on. Rather than kicking off my sandals, figuratively speaking, dropping the staff, I don't need anything. I stand in the presence of God. He will keep me safe and protected. I don't need to be attached. In fact, my prayer should be one of begging for mercy, one of surrender. Rather than petitioning, I should be listening. And here come the attachments. And those attachments now have become my own bondage that I've created, yes? Yes. I didn't do the dirt to pray, I gotta run home. I'm off base because it no, I got on my knees, says, Father, take me like the wretch I am here to do your will. Please. Done. If it was that, if it was that simple. It's the intent at which I show up to the altar. Because we have all these beautiful prayers that we learn. And like me, we go back to our religious community, we get more prayers. And somehow I think that has elevated me. To the person who's never heard of prayer. What about the guy who's under a bridge right now, who, who's total maybe atheist, and bottoms out and says, if you're out there, please, I need your mercy, get me sober. Is that not just as powerful as someone in here with 10 years saying, please help me get over this? It's the same, same thing. God's not a respect of men. I like you more than you. It's God. He has no stepchildren. But it's the intent at which I pray and meditate. But I can get stuff in the way. Okay. I just want to share this. The man who does not permit his spirit to be beaten down and upset by dryness and helplessness, but who lets God lead him peacefully through the wilderness and desires no other support or guidance than that of pure faith and trust in God alone will be brought to the promised land. He or she will taste the peace and joy of union with God. He will without seeing have a habitual comforting, obscure and mysterious awareness of his God 
present and acting in all the events of life. The man who is not afraid to abandon all his spiritual progress into the hands of God, take no credit, to put prayer, virtue, merit, grace, and all gifts in the keeping of him from whom they all must come will, click, will quickly be led to peace in union with him. His peace will be all the sweeter because it will be free of every care. It screams no self-reliance. It screams everything's with God. The problem is the mind and the ego. You ever notice anger needs to think and love doesn't? You ever notice through adversity, we learn to let go of the things that we thought we needed to be happy? I've experienced adversity. Does my relationship with God hinge on adversity or prosperity? Things are good. I love God. Things aren't. I hate God. I've been next to bankruptcy. And the, thought, the things I thought I needed, that car, this amount of money, those clothes, I didn't. I didn't need anything. I just need a roof over my head. And you know what? When I had no money to pay rent, my mortgage at the time, when I had no money to pay my electric bill, I was living, I had my own home at the time, was about to lose it through a divorce, and I was out of work. She was taking everything, took the money, took the car, took everything, and I'm out of work. There were people in the AA who says, we got you, how much? Whatever it is. You see that? Because God will send in the troops to help us. My mind doesn't believe that though. And I had enough to stay afloat. Not the way I wanted to. But no matter how much I want to, I always want more anyway. But I was staying afloat. Had food in my belly. Roof over my head until she took everything. And I got a car. AA took care of me from the day I walked in here. My mind doesn't want to see that. My attachments to my methodology, to my prayer. Because what happens to me as an alcoholic, once I do that little ritual in the morning, I'm not knocking prayer, guys. I'm not knocking meditating. And if you're doing this stuff, you'll outgrow it, hopefully, where you understand why I'm praying what I'm doing in there, that I work for God. I need his mercy. I need his forgiveness. I need, the, I need endurance to go out and do this. 30 years sober. I never stuck around anything for 30 years. 30 years, still going to meetings, thank the good Lord, still sponsoring, have a sponsor. Do all the things many of us do. 30, that's a long time. Not like I'm sober, like I'm some big shot. It's a long time for any alcoholic who's undisciplined to be disciplined that long. That's endurance, not from me, but it's coming from the Father. The courage, strength, and direction to get through obstacles, loss of job, loss of loved one, no money. Oh my God, how am I going to pay my mortgage? There's no food in the refrigerator. They're about to shut off everything. How am I going to do this? One day at a time, chop wood, carry water. And when there's no ego or less of ego, I can go to a friend and say, I'm in trouble. They will know it. What do you need? My ego doesn't want to see that. My mind doesn't want to even listen to that. My, one, my mind and ego want to say, see, I told you. Now get a drink and we'll forget about everything. What I'm doing right now when we go to meetings is we communicate. We tell stories. What it was like, what happens like now, a step, a tradition, and we explain the methodology and we talk about the layers underneath it. What was step, what was step one like? We understand body, mind, and spirit, powers over alcohol, life's unmanageable, we talk about that. What's underneath that? What did that look like? How did I get there? How did I concede to my innermost self? 10, 11, and 12, prayer, meditation, writing inventory, etc. But what does that actually feel like and look like and where are we with that right now? One of the things that I always need to take a look at is besides communicating with you, communicating with my sponsor, reading a book that communicates to us. When I talk to God, I'm communicating. Language. 
What about communing? It's a very intimate thing. A loving couple. One of the bonds is they talk to each other like they don't talk to other people. I'm not talking about anger. I'm talking about loving. <laughs> Will you share vulnerability with him or her? You talk to, I talk to Marion on a very personal, intimate level. There was no show, talk to her, not at her, and vice versa. That's an emotional bond. That's a loving bond. With me? That as time is doing a day, we work together. You know, uh, make sure that group gets done and we got to make that call. That's just communicating stuff. A relationship built on that is going to fall. There's got to be that thing. Am I communing with God? Communicate in the morning. Oh, God, you know, keep me clean and sober. Turn me into Moses. I got a talk to do tonight. Let me floor the room. You know, we do stuff like that. I need to hit Powerball, God. I'm a good guy. We talk to God. And then we meditate, and we're watching ourselves meditate because I need to turn into Moses after this meditation. You gotta levitate out of the room. Okay. I get up and go to work. Driving in my car, I'm at work, I have lunch, I go out and smoke cigarettes or whatever we do. We, we talk to some of our friends, we drive home from work, we have some time with the family, we have some dinner, go to a meeting, come home, do prayer meditation. And I'm basically looking at morning and evening of talking to God, just talking or really at God. And throughout the day, how much communing am I doing with God? Like, I, I can, some of us get the hour lunch break, right? Some of us get a little longer than that. Does it really take a whole hour, five days a week to eat lunch? I finish lunch in about three seconds. <laughs> then what do I do? Talk, social media, worry, think, <laughs> hate, anger, you know, politics. Wow, that was a fast, I gotta get back to work. And then I'm dealing with work during my lunch hour. Have some lunch if I'm in the mood to eat. Maybe I go smoke a cigar, maybe I don't. See some friends. Then I lock my office door, or I sit in my car. Thank you, Father. What do you need me to do today? Let me seek your will. Thank you for putting air in my lungs another day. Please keep me out of my own way. Let me be of service. Things like this. I'm, I'm communing. And then I listen. Sometimes when you sponsor someone, they're constantly talking and they don't stop to take direction. That's a difficult relationship. But it's nice when you talk, they listen, they talk, you listen, we connect. And it's better when they say, listen, I'm sponsoring Paul, pretend. Paul, I need you to go home and read chapter 3 tonight. And tomorrow he says, Pete, I did the reading. I have some questions. Great. Rather than Paul never calling. That's frustrating. So God will feed us information and we just follow directions. The sponsor will give us information and follow directions. Am I communing with God? The layers, I was taught 10, 11, and 12. I go through the work to be rocketed into 10, 11, and 12. We access power, boom, into 10, 11, 12. We grow. We have more experiences. There's a meeting in the back of the room. I'll wait. I'm giving you my blood, man. And the ground gets fertile. And we keep seeking this power and communing with God, praying and meditating. No more attachments to it, wherever God's going to take us. And sometimes we're wondering, is God paying attention to me? I'm praying, I'm meditating, I'm communing, and I'm hitting the desert. And I'm not feeling anything. I feel like I'm barefoot on, on, on rocks going through this unlimited, charted, uncharted territory. When am I going to get the thing? And the tendency is to quit and go back to doing what I was doing, going to a couple of meetings, just checking in with God because that stuff doesn't work. But for those of us, and Merton talks about it, who just continue to chop wood and carry water with no reliance, no dependence on anything but God, 
we will be brought to the other side, and it's fruitful. This is what's underneath the work, our experiences. I've come into Alcoholics Anonymous flat broke for a long time. I've come into Alcoholics Anonymous with a pocket full of money a few times. I've come into Alcoholics Anonymous dating, engaged, married, back from the honeymoon, bliss, divorce. Hmm? Bought a house, just lost it. Yeah, that kind of thing. And I've come here and poured my guts out. And all I got was hugs back to God. Hugs back to God. And the good teacher said, we will help you, but your reliance is upon God, not us. In the 10, 11, step 10, 11, they don't, they give us instructions, but they don't tell us about the layers. That's our own experience. So I'll share something with you, and I'm just about out of time here. Mary, my better half, and I were scheduled to go to Sweden to do a weekend workshop. And uh, <clears throat> we leave Fort Lauderdale, and we're excited about going to Sweden. I've been to Europe many times. Marion's never been out of the country, so she was really excited and was planning to go do AA stuff in Sweden. And we fly from uh, Florida, and we had to connect in Newark Airport. Now, if you haven't been through Newark Airport, New Jersey, this is not the training ground for spiritual growth. <laughs> I mean, people are pissed off at sunrise up there, you know. And uh, <clears throat> we go to the international gate, and we can't, the air conditioning, I remember, was broke. It was summertime, and it was hot and stuffy. It was mobbed with people, and we can't find our airline gate. There's all these other airlines. We're asking people, find it yourself. You know, it was like that. So we're getting tired. Uh, we couldn't find anything good to eat. I got about a seven or nine hour flight to Europe through the night. And I'm starting to pay attention to my mind, which sounds like, what are you doing? And who are you, Mr. Big Shot, going to Sweden? They don't have speakers there. What are you, like a big deal now? I look over at Marion. She says, why does a ghost? And she says, I don't know if I want to go. I'm getting nervous. I said, I don't think I want to go either. So the mind saying, let's make a long distance call. Tell him something. Let's lie. We'll get out of it. Somebody else, this is where we are now. But because of the chopping wood and carrying water and the endurance and the undercurrent of godliness, not me or her, Marion's moved to say, let's pray right now in the middle of the airport, which is very unpopular right now out there. Prayer and God right now in today's society is a bad word, it's a four letter word. So that's what we do. We held hands, closed our eyes and prayed. And Marion led the prayer. When we opened our eyes, there was a woman about 10 feet from us smiling. Now in Jersey, if a stranger smiling at you, run. Because that's how <laughs> And she, she looked and she says, it's so nice to see people praying in public. And so we walked over to each other and we start talking. And we told her what we're doing because she asked and we're going to uh, Sweden to do the same thing. She said, oh, I have family in AA and in Al-Anon. She was on the same flight with us going back to Sweden. Her dad was terminally ill. She was going back there to spend some time with her dad and be when he passed. And uh, we had this great conversation and she said to us, I need to ask you what you were praying. I'm just curious. And Marion says, the theme of it was, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And she stopped. She said, I can't believe this. So I was getting dressed this morning. And on my dresser drawer, I have this bangle, a bracelet. It's been sitting there forever. When I was getting dressed, something moved me to put it on. So I put it on. She says, now I know why. And she took it off and she handed it to Mary and she said, I'd like you to have this. And what was written on the inside of the bangle was, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. At that point, I'm going, let's go to Sweden and rock and roll. <laughs> so she told us that where she was sitting. I says, once we get up in the air and the bell goes off, you can move around. Let's talk. We got like a seven or nine hour flight. We'll hang out and blah, blah, blah. So that's what happens. Marion gets up. So I'm going to go find her. She gave us a seat number. Marion comes back. She says, she's not there. I said, well, maybe she went to the ladies room. No, someone was sitting in that chair. Maybe she gave you the wrong seat. Wait a little while. 
Half hour, an hour goes by, Marion goes looking for her again. Now, Marion's one of us. So at this point, Marion's looking in overhead compartments and underneath people's <laughs> chairs. Right? Yeah, yeah. This woman, we cannot find. We were way up front in the plane. So when we deplaned, we stood right at that gate waiting for this woman to get off. And she never got off the plane. Now, perhaps she never got on the plane. Perhaps she lied. Perhaps a lot of things. Or... What I've learned from some of my God winks, my God experiences, and many of yours, that God sends us off to do a task. It speaks through a group conscience. God speaks through a group conscience. Our tradition tells us that. So God's going to send in the guardian angels to get us there because we went there. We had a great weekend. And God says, I got you. I'm sending someone in. When it was over, it was like God looking, say, see, I got you. You do my work and I will take care of you. Let me take care of you. You do my work. I take care of you. That came as a result of dependence upon prayer and God. There was no sponsor in the airport at that time I could have called. There was no meeting in the airport that I knew of. It was us and God and dependence, total dependence, relinquishing all control. Those are the layers when we're afraid, who do we turn to? When we have moments of skepticism and doubt, which we will, who am I turning to? Turning in to go out or am I just turning out? Trying to find some okayness in here. So over and over and over again, I turn back to my heavenly father and ask for direction because I know, even when my mind says no, that he will provide, he will give us all we need to do this job, to do this work, because that's who we work for. That's all I got, peace.